everybody and welcome to my session with the title Going Underground with InfluxDB. My name is Tobias Braun. I'm a software architect at Herrnknecht AG in Germany. We are a manufacturer of tunnel boring machines and I will on the next slide present you uh, what this session will be about and uh, what I want to tell you. First of all, I want to um, introduce Herrnknecht AG and myself. After that, I will, I will talk about um, the process of building an IoT platform for Handlicht AG and I will focus the handling of sensor data. We have a lot of other systems involved, but uh, with InfluxDB we are especially focusing on the handling of sensor data. I will then talk about InfluxDB as a central time series storage, why we chose it and what experiences we, did with, we had with it. Then I will talk about our migration to InfluxDB Enterprise and last but not least I will show you the current status of the product. Handlicht AG is um, the world market leader for tunnel boring machines. The company was founded in 1977 in Germany. We are building machines uh, for all kinds of tunnels. We are building machines for traffic tunneling, utility and mining with different sizes from 10 centimeters to 19 meters of diameter. We build vertical and horizontal tunnels and our machines can work in all geologies. They can even work underwater. We occupy a major share of the global market. Much more than 50% of the global market of tunnel boring machines are covered by us. We have 5,300 employees and last year's revenue was a little more than 1 billion euro. We are present on uh, the entire world. We have offices in, uh, on all continents to be present with the, 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 the job sites. As I said, my name is Tobias Braun. I'm a software architect. I have more than 20 years of experience in building highly available distributed systems. I have, amongst others, worked for run at one IONOS and the web hosting team. I work for Voda, a German printing house, and I worked for Trumpf Werkzeug Maschinen GmbH, which is a machine tool manufacturer, and I was involved in building an IIT platform there. Two and a half years ago, I joined Herrnknecht as a software architect with the goal of building an IIoT platform with insight into live and historic data for all tunnel boring machines that we delivered. We are right now a small agile team of only four developers where the front-end development is supported by an external partner. Because we are so small, we are very agile and fast, but we also have to compromise and gradually improve what we build. In the next couple of minutes, I want to tell you about the requirements and the challenges that we are involved in building an industrial IoT platform for Herrnknecht AG. As I said, we are present on the market for, for more than 40 years. And over time, of course, the diameter of our machines gradually increased. It started with uh, four to five meters and the biggest machines we now are able to build is uh, almost 20 meters in diameter. The same time, uh, the, the diameter grew, grew, also the amount of data that a machine was capturing grew tremendously. I will show you in a, in a couple of seconds. As you can imagine, having current and correct data is vital for an TBM operator. He decides what to do, uh, how, which direction the machine uh, to direct to, how to react on certain events. So we, we always need to have current data that is correct and display for the TBM operator. As you see here, this is a typical operator screen that is used in the control room of the tunnel boring machine. Some challenges we had while building the industrial IoT platform. The platform has to support more than 2,000 tunnel boring machines. Several hundred of them are working simultaneously in the field. A single machine can have 5,000 newer machines, even more sensors. And some of those sensors have sample rates of 100 milliseconds and less. So we have 10 samples per second, sometimes even more for a single machine. 
The job sites are often in remote locations. The tunnel is uh, maybe 10, 12, 15 kilometers deep. So we don't have a good network connection into the tunnel. Often we have limited bandwidth and we also have to cope with with failing connectivity for sometimes days, weeks, or even months where the tunnel boring machine is completely offline and disconnected from the internet. Furthermore, we collected data from machines from the last 40 years, not from all machines, but from, from some of them. And we also want to make available data from those machines. And this data exists in a lot of different formats. We do have data in SQL databases, in DBase files, even CSV files. And all of this has to be made, a, made available in the platform. As I said, we are a small team, so a platform we build has to be developed and maintained by a small team. We don't have a lot of people and we want to focus on feature development. We don't want to focus on operations and um, DevOps tasks. So we have to be smart here in order to uh, develop the right things and not develop everything from scratch, but use what is there. We decided to start with the absolute basics. We have to make sure the data is recorded consistently. This sounds very easy, but we found out it isn't, because um, in order to be actually correct in what you record, you have to have a great understanding of the processes on the tunnel boring machine and some limitations that are there. So we decided to develop first a solution that is running on the tunnel boring machine because we need to be available even when the machine is offline. And after that is done, once we have a stable operations there, and then we want to jump into the cloud and transfer the processes we have into the cloud. A requirement is that we want to have a platform that is fit for the next 10 to 15 years. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel every five years. We want to have a stable system that is able to grow with us. And of course we need, in order to be stable for 15 years, we need a robust and flexible architecture where you can exchange components anytime you need without a lot of effort or without a lot of outages. Next, I want to focus on our decision to choose InfluxDB as a central time series storage for our platform. The most important criteria for us were the fact that InfluxDB is open source, but that there is also a commercial enterprise edition uh, when we want to grow. Back then, when the decision was made a couple of years ago, it was important to us that there's a Windows service available so that it can run on Windows because our tunnel boring machines are running on Windows. And we didn't want to invest a lot of effort in uh, setting up an additional Linux system at the same time. So a couple of years back, this was important. Nowadays, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, nowadays, we can also work with Linux on the tunnel boring machine, but still we're happy that we can run InfluxDB on Windows. A very important fact was that InfluxDB offers a very space efficient storage solution. We have a lot of data to store and we don't want to pay a lot of money for it. On the tunnel boring machine, we don't have a lot of storage available. And InfluxDB offers a query language that is similar to SQL with very powerful aggregations, which was, which was very useful for us because, as I said, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We can use the aggregations that are there and just put our services on top of them. Concerning robustness, the fact that InfluxDB is storing its data in simple flat files leads to a very robust system where you don't have uh, a lot of file system issues in, in storing files. So uh, making backups of InfluxDBs is very simple, for example. So where is our sensor data stored? We store it on site, as I said, on the tunnel boring machine. On the right hand side, you see a typical control room with the control computers. And one of those computers is the visualization computer, where you can see in the screen that I showed in the beginning, so the, the operator screen. On this computer, we, we have the most current data available, because all data that is gathered by sensors on the tunnel boring machine is available on this computer in the most current fashion, because the operator needs it there. So this is where we sit on top, where our service runs, and we grab those, this data and store it with a self-written service into InfluxDB. Because we don't want to write 
unnecessary data into InfluxDB. We do data cleansing there, so we do rounding of data values. We remove duplicate values and store just the changes in the InfluxDB system on the visualization computer. As I said, this was the first thing we developed. Later on, we moved to the cloud. And the cloud, we are now working with InfluxDB Enterprise and we are running it on Microsoft Azure VMs. Next, I want to give you a very brief overview of how we store this data. We decided to use a very pragmatic approach here, which really worked great for us. It might not for you, but for us it was really great working this way and all the requirements we had in the last years could be easily fulfilled with this kind of data storage. We decided to have one big measurement for all the sensor data and for every sensor we have, we have a float field. So we have really a, a big measurement with a couple of thousand of fields and every field is a float. We use tags, but only very few of them for special operational states of the machine. For example, if the machine is currently working or not, is a Boolean tag where we say it's now it's working or now it's not working. This leads also to a low tag cardinality, which in, in the later days was, was good for InfluxDB. I learned that nowadays it's not a problem anymore to have a lot of cardinality for tags but we, we don't need it, so we still stick with the paradigm to have low tag cardinality. And we only write values when there was a significant change. So before deciding if there was a significant change with rounding of values, if we know a sensor only has a certain accuracy, then we reround to this accuracy and only when the value changes more than this accuracy, then we write a value to the influx dB. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see a typical stream of data that we capture. This is only 10 seconds of data for two sensors now. And here you see uh, for one sensor we had uh, a lot of changes, for the other one we, we didn't. And we only write the data that actually changed. Overall, this enables us to have very, no, rather few data written. In average, we'd write one to five gigabytes of data per month and machine. When moving to the cloud, first of all, we, we decided to keep it simple. Um, well knowing that this might not be in the, the approach that will take us to the, the ultimate goal, but uh, it was very good for a start. We decided to work on Kubernetes and we decided to run InfluxDB inside of Kubernetes with one influx container per tunnel boring machine. So for every tunnel boring machine that is present in the cloud, we have one influx container running. We do no clustering of InfluxDB. We accept the risk that uh, the database of a single tunnel boring machine might be offline for a couple of seconds or even one or two minutes when a cluster node goes down. In order to have cheap and reliable storage available, we decided to use Azure file storage which is basically equivalent to a Windows share. Of course, we try to make sure that InfluxDB is working well with this kind of storage and our tests were successful, so we decided to go with it because this was the, the simplest and cheapest solution. This approach had some advantages, of course. We wouldn't have chosen it otherwise. The architecture in that way is almost identical to what we run on the tunnel boring machine. So all the components that are running on the tunnel boring machine can run identically in the cloud. So we didn't have to develop a lot of new stuff. We have isolated impact zones. The outage of one, um, the outage of one influx database does not affect the others. They are completely isolated. We can use the cheap pay-per-use storage and only pay the gigabytes that we actually use. And we have a file-based backup that we can use for free. And we have no licensing cost for InfluxDB. We have a lot of containers there running there, so um, it would have been privately expensive to, to have to license all of those containers. But with the open source version, this was not an issue at all. So I want to briefly tell you how we transfer the data from the tunnel boring machine to the cloud. First of all, of course, we can only transfer data when the machine is, on, is online. 
when the machine is offline, it captures data, it stores the data locally, but um, the, the transfer of data has to resume without gaps when the machine is coming back online. So all captured data has to arrive in the cloud. For historic data, the, the transfer is quite simple. We have the historic data in the different formats and we just have conversion scripts that convert this data in batches into InfluxDB format. For those older machines that are not running anymore, we have historic data and we don't get new data, so this is a one-time job and when it's done, it's done. We have the data in the cloud. For live data, we have the advantage that the data cleansing is already done on the machine, so we only have to transfer the data that is written to the machine and we don't have to process it anymore when transferring it to the cloud. So basically what we do is we mirror all the data that is written on the machine into the cloud. To achieve this, we build a custom synchronization which is based on a custom REST API. A very important fact that we achieve by this is that the data is identical. Data on the tunnel boring machine and data in the cloud is really to the bit identical. And this is very important because we need to show the same graphs, the same analysis, the same charts on the cloud and on the machine. There must not be any differences in data that we, that we display, that we show. Next, I want to tell you about our migration to InfluxDB Enterprise, so why we had to migrate and how we did it. Our pragmatic approach had, we expected it, some issues. They appeared later than we expected, so we were really running well with the pragmatic approach until around about 100 InfluxDB containers. But once we grew over 100 containers, the overall system became unreliable. The most pressing issue was that response times of the InfluxDBs became very long. So instead of a typical response time of 100 or 200 milliseconds, we experienced response times of up to a minute or even two minutes for very simple queries. And it was not at all clear which queries would show such long response times. This was purely random. And we found out it was based on the Azure file storage that we put below our InfluxDBs. This was a limitation in the file storage. And on top, the infrastructure became very expensive because um, running all those containers, of course, needs Kubernetes nodes to run on. And we had to, to buy a lot of Kubernetes nodes, which became more than expensive. We also encountered a very rare bug where the file storage sometimes forgot to unlock files. And when InfluxDB wanted to access this file for the next time, then there was an error and then the, uh, the access failed. And as you can imagine, uh, this might be a rare case, but if you have hundreds of uh, containers doing the same thing, even rare cases tend to happen regularly. So we encounter this at the end uh, a couple of times a week. And this always included manual maintenance effort to, to repair those locks. So what did we do then? We, we first tried to work with InfluxDB on the open source version in, in different ways, but combined with our expectation to be to have an overall system that is very reliable, this was not a solution that would work. And this is why we decided to InfluxDB Enterprise. The point in time where we migrated, we had around about 750 gigabytes of data in about 200 databases, which is for InfluxDB really not a lot. For us, it, it was a lot, and uh, on top it was very important data because it was only one place where this data was stored for tunnel boring machines that finished their project and went offline. So we only had one storage where the data was available. The platform was already live at this point in time, so we didn't want to introduce a lot of downtime during the migration. Our goal was to have a downtime of at most a couple of minutes for each TBM while we migrate the data to InfluxDB Enterprise. And as a small team with limited capacity, we didn't have to, the, the possibility to do a lot of manual work. We had to migrate most of the migration tasks. 
we managed to do this migration in the first quarter of 2020. It took less than two weeks. It was really very successful. We wrote a couple of rather simple shell scripts, um, which robustly migrated the data from the InfluxDB containers in Kubernetes into a new InfluxDB enterprise cluster that we set up together with the Influx data company. We managed to get no read downtime at all, so we had a fluent transition from the, the Kubernetes InfluxDB containers to the enterprise ones. And we had to accept a write downtime of less than 60 minutes, which was fine because we just had to stop the one task that writes the data into InfluxDB for this time. After the migration, we see that the total cost of ownership of our Influx databases was reduced by one third, which is great. This is mostly due to the fact that we need much that we need now much less VMs to run InfluxDB on. Instead of having a lot of Kubernetes nodes for all those Influx containers, we now have a small cluster of InfluxDB enterprise, which is much cheaper. On top of that, we have a very extensive monitoring and we have a stable operation since the, the whole migration. We didn't have one major outage at all. And from a product point of view, the best, solution, the best result that we have is that we now have reliable and reproducible response times for all queries. Last but not least, I want to show you a, a brief couple of slides where you can see the product as it's working. We rolled out to, to first paying customers and they are very happy with that. Here you can see a typical overview screen that a customer uses to, to track the progress and the performance of his machines. This is a demonstration machine where you can see how fast the machine is progressing, uh, how much energy is it's taking, the wear of the, the different components is visible. So all the key performance indicators of a typical machine is available on, on one slide and on the lower hand side in this charts, this is data directly from InfluxDB which is displayed here. Although InfluxDB has very powerful aggregations, we learned that we can't fulfill all of our requirements based on, on this. So what we had to do was we had to write an API on top of InfluxDB that enriches and enhances the data that we store there. For example, in this slide, you can see a typical, typical charts of machine operations where we have different kind of data. In the upper chart, you see the rotation speeds of our cutting wheel overlaid with the direction in which the cutting wheel is being turned. The direction is a, a bit field, which is shown in the bars, and uh, the chart is showing the, the rotational speed. The charts component is also written by ourselves. We started with Grafana, but we, as I said, we learned that it was not sufficient to fulfill all of our requirements, so we had to write our own front end that is presenting the data exactly in the way we want it to be presented. So the status of the product is we receive very positive feedback from customers, from our internal users. So a lot of people are using the platform and all of them are very happy with it. Our small team can concentrate on feature development. We have little DevOps efforts. We still have the open source version of InfluxDB on every TBM that we deliver. And we have InfluxDB Enterprise in the cloud and it just works in the background. We don't really have to, to take a lot of care with it. It uh, is just there and, and is reliable. So we don't have a lot of DevOps efforts here. This brings us to the end of my session. Thank you for the attention. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact me anytime. Here's my email address. And I wish you a great remaining time at the Influx Days 2021. Thank you.